It's a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Thank you for inviting me to talk. And indeed, I'm going to talk about the existence of equilibrium in tail measurable Borel Blackwell games. This is joint work with Janusz Flesch and Arkady Predeczynski. They are both from Maastricht University and Elon Solan from Tel Aviv University. And the research was funded by GameNet, it's an European Union cost action. So let's begin. Um, the talk outline, I'm going to begin with background, what was done and what is the motivation for the question that we are trying to answer, trying to convince you that it's an important question. Then I will describe what is our contribution to this respectable line of research, the definitions and the actual results. And then I'm going to walk you through the main ideas of the main proof and it will have three steps. The first step has to do with the regularity of the min max value. Second step is going to discuss games with Borel tail winning sets. And then the last final step, tail payoff function, that's the most general part. Then I will discuss possibilities to make it a little bit more general, to push a little bit farther the results that we have, and then some open questions. And let me just say that this is what I'm introducing to you is everything that we're absolutely certain that is uh, right. But this is in some sense still work in progress. So at least in two points, I'm gonna to point to things that were done, but we think that we can do better, only we're not certain about it yet. So more to come. So first question, what are infinite horizon two player zero sum games? Uh, and I'm going to begin with the simplest model one with alternating moves. So what is that? First, we have two players. We give them the original names, player one and player two. And this is how this game goes. Player one chooses player one's first action. And here it is, player one's first action, A11. Player two, having observed the choice of player one, chooses his first action. Then player one chooses another action. And then player two chooses his second action, the one is third, and this goes on forever. So this is a two player zero sum game with alternating moves. Of course, this sequence of choices, A11, A12, A21, A22, this infinite sequence of choices, this has a name, we call it a play. And in addition to this rule of how uh, they interact, there is W, a set of plays, and this W determines who wins this game. So this is a game that has a winner, a winner and a loser. So player one is the winner of the game if this play, this infinite sequence of choices belongs to W, to this set of plays. Player two wins otherwise. So we have a winner and it's a single winner. It's either player one or player two, so no tie no other possibilities. And if we think of the winner as getting a payoff of one and of the loser as getting a payoff of minus one, then it's clear that it is special type of zero sum game. In this uh, framework, we call a game determined if one of the players has a winning strategy. A winning strategy is a strategy that guarantees that the player wins against any possible strategy of his opponent. Whatever the opponent does, it guarantees a win. What is known about Infinite Horizon two player zero sum games with alternating moves? So what is known? The first thing that is known is that if it is a finite horizon game, or even you can think of infinite horizon game where the identity of the winner depends only on some finite number of periods, finite number of actions. So if the game has a finite horizon, then it is determined. In fact, if I give you five minutes, you can probably think of the proof. It's a simple backwards induction. Galen Stewart in 53 proved that if the winning set, this W, where if the play is inside W, player one wins. If the winning set is either open or closed, then the game is determined. Then one of the players has a strategy that is a winning strategy, regardless of what the opponent is doing, he wins. Martin later in 75 
generalized it. He proved that if the winning set is Borel measurable, then the game is determined. And I have three things to say about the result of Martin. The first is that if the winning set is not Borel, then the game is not necessarily determined. And in fact, Galen Stewart already showed that. The second is that the proof that Martin have in 75 is rather involved and he was not happy with that. So he published an even simpler proof in 82. So there is the proof of 75 and there is a simpler proof in 82. And the third point is that the, this uh, result of Martin has also implications in other area of mathematical research uh, in set theory, but this is beyond the scope of this talk. I'm just mentioning it. Blackwell, the mathematician Blackwell, introduced a small variation of this game when the difference is that now the players move simultaneously. So when player two chooses his action, he doesn't know what is the choice of player one. Now, if you think of even very simple games where the players move simultaneously, so suppose that we have an infinite play like before, but everything depends on what they do on the first period. The, the identity of the winner depends on what they do on the first period. And suppose that in the first period, what they play is something that we call matching pennies, which is equivalent to Zugo Peret in Hebrew. Uh, so one player chooses heads or tail, and the other player chooses heads or tails. And if their choices matches, then player one wins. And if they don't match, then player two wins. And they do it simultaneously. Again, that's the difference here. It's very easy to see that there is no winning strategy. You cannot guarantee to win regardless what your opponent is doing. In fact, the best that you can do is randomize with probability one half you choose heads, with probability one half you choose tail. And the result of that is that you win with probability half. And you cannot do anything better than that. So player one, can, uh, the best he can do is win with probability half and player two who wants player one not to win also can force down the probability of player one to win to one half. So often there is no winning strategy. The example that we gave is matching pennies. In these games, we have what we call a value. And this value is indeed with mixed strategies, strategies that allow the players to randomize on their actions. So what is this value? Player one wants to win. He wants to have the maximal probability that the play will end up in his winning set W. Player two, of course, doesn't want player one to win. He wants to reduce the probability of player one to win to the bare minimum. So there, we say that there exists a value if the infimum over all the possible strategies of player two, soup of all the strategies of player one, the probability that we end up, that the play ends up being in the winning set is equal to the soup inf. And if this happens, then we have a value. It means that player one can guarantee to win with probability at least the value. Player two can guarantee that player one doesn't win with probability more than the value. And this is the value. Blackwell in 69, when he introduced these games, also proved that if the action sets are finite and the winning set is a countable intersection of open sets, then the game indeed has a value. Then Martin generalized this result and he looked at a more general payoff. So, so far we had a winner who gets say one and the loser who gets say minus one. So you can eventually get either one or minus one. Martin said, why restrict ourselves to one and minus one? Let's just have a function from the possible set of plays to R. So whatever play we play, there is a payoff that player one gets. And again, this is still a zero sum game. So what player two is just minus this value. So there is one number assigned to each play, which represents what player one gets. And you can think of it as what player two pays to player one. So this is the model of Blackwell, a more general one. 
this game also has a value, which is quite similar to the value we described before, or might have a value. Uh, it has a value if the inf soup of the expected value of this payoff to player one is equal to the soup inf, where again the maximizer is player one and the minimizer is player two, because this is the payoff of player one and this is what player two is paying. Martin in 98 proved that if the action sets are finite and G is bounded Borel measurable, then the value exists. This is uh, where I want to begin to describe our contribution. So this is the background to the question that we asked ourselves. We wanted to push these results farther and to go beyond zero sum. Okay, so we want to look at this game when we consider not necessarily zero sum games. So what is the difference, the main difficulty, what's the challenge in going beyond zero sum games? Well, first thing, I don't know if it's a challenge, maybe it's kind of nice. We can have any number of players, okay? And any player has his own payoff function. So there is not a single function of payoff, but the number of players determine how many payoff functions we have. So one way to describe an infinite Blackwell game is we have G, the game. It is composed of I, which is a set of players. Right now we're talking about a finite set of players. The possibility to extend it will be discussed if we have time at the end of this talk. So a finite set of players. And for each player, we have G, I, a payoff function that tells him what does he get for any possible infinite play. I, I didn't say it at the beginning, but people, if you have any question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, so is, is GI always bounded? We will assume assumptions about the GI. Yes, it's going to be bounded and it's going to be Borel measurable. Yes, th there will be assumptions. <laughs> yeah. When we go beyond uh, zero sum, there is no exact interpretation of what is a value. A value is one number, right? Now we have a different functions, a function for each player. So it's less natural to talk about a value, although there will be a concept that is going to be somehow reminding of a value. It's more natural to talk about a Nash equilibrium. So what's a Nash equilibrium? We have a vector of strategy strategy for player one, strategy for player two, strategy for each player. And I didn't define it formally, but strategy is like the book of rules that tells you what to play in each and every event, in, in any situation of the game so far. Or if you wish for any finite history, if it's your turn to play, it tells you how to choose your next action. So a Nash equilibrium is a vector of strategy strategy for player one, strategy for player two, a strategy of player three, such that for each one of the players, it should be GI here, sorry, instead of G, not playing the strategy that was assigned to him, replacing it with some S prime that is different, he cannot profit for that, from, from that. The expected payoff when you conform to the strategy that the equilibrium assigns to you, is at least as good as the expected payoff that you get if you deviate and play something else. Sometimes, and we will see in a minute when, sometimes we cannot have an exact Nash equilibrium, so we need to resort to Epsilon Nash equilibrium, which is almost the same, besides the fact that it means that you may gain something but not more than epsilon. So deviating, playing something different, another strategy than the one that the equilibrium subscribed to you may result in some gain, but it's a very small one, less than epsilon. A player cannot profit more than epsilon by playing something different than the epsilon equilibrium strategy. Hey, Galit, I have a small question. So this, yeah. this strategy, the strategy can be random? So yeah, you're allowed to randomize. Yes, yes, yes. You're allowed to randomize over your set of actions. Everything. Definitely. Okay. 
Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, a strategy, if to be accurate, is a function from all possible histories to the uh, convex of your set of actions, to a randomization over, over your set of actions. Yes. Yes. Okay, so let's see a few things that happen when we move beyond zero sum games. What can happen? So first thing, why did I bother with epsilon equilibrium? Because sometimes that's the only thing that exists. And here is a small example for that. So suppose that we have just one player, single player playing alone, and he has two actions, one and two. And, we, and he plays again and again and again. And we let T to be the first time where two is played and artificially define T to be one if two is never played. So the idea is he wants to play two for the first time as late as possible, but he wants to play it eventually, okay? Clearly, he cannot get to his maximal payoff, but whatever period he decides to play the two in for the first time, he can always do better by postponing it just a little bit more. One minus one divided by T is his payoff, okay? So we can always gain more by pushing it forward a little bit. There is no equilibrium here, but there is an epsilon equilibrium. Give me an epsilon and I will show you a period far enough in the future where if he plays two for the first time there, then he cannot gain more than epsilon by being there. So this is why we need to define the concept of epsilon equilibrium. Simply sometimes an accurate equilibrium doesn't exist. Here is another phenomena we may have multiple equilibrium. So consider, again, an infinitely repeated game, but everything for simplicity depends again on what happens in the first period. And during the first period, the players, two players, they play this game. When player one is choosing the line and the line can be top or bottom, so his set of actions are T and B. Player two, two is choosing a column, left and right. And when they both choose actions, the resulting payoff of the play is simply the vector of payoffs described here. So here they both get a zero, and here they both get one, they both get two, they both get zero. This is, by the way, is called a coordination game, and I, you can understand why. So here is one possible equilibrium. On the first period, player one chooses B, player two chooses A. The resulting payoff, one to player one, one for player two. Player one, if he unilaterally, he alone deviates from B to T, he reduces his own payoff to zero, and that's not profitable. Player two, again, unilat considering unilateral deviation, if he deviates from left to right, he gets zero, not profitable. So playing B and L on the first period is a Nash equilibrium. Is it the best that they can do? Obviously not. They can get the two, two, for example, okay? How can they get to two? To decide to play T and R, and this is of course also a Nash equilibrium, and there is also another one where they randomize. So when we go into repeated games that are not zero sum, we may have many equilibrium. In fact, generally or often in the literature of repeated non-zero sum games, one of the prominent questions when we know, when we already established that an equilibrium exists and we know that there is often more than one, one question that is, this work is not about this, but other works are, to characterize the set of equilibria payoffs and the set of equilibria. So when we go beyond zero sign, we sometimes need epsilon equilibrium and we sometimes have more than one equilibrium. And yes, this project focuses on a specific type of winning sets and a specific type of payoff functions of these Gs that I used before. This project is about tail measurable sets. So what are 
tail measurable sets. A set of plays Q is called tail measurable if for every play, infinite sequence of choices of actions, if I replace a finite number of coordinates, so A1 here, just to be clear, A1 here is the vector of actions of the, the, the players played during the first period, an action for player one, action for player two. A2 is the actions that they played, okay, we call it action profile, the action profile that was played in the second period, and A3, the action profile that was played in the third period and so on. So take any finite set of action profiles and change them to something else, to anything else, any other action profiles, it does not change the membership in the set Q. So if P belong to Q, you change finite number of coordinates, P still belongs to Q. If it didn't belong to Q, change any finite number of coordinates, P still does not belong to Q. This is a tail, this is what we call a tail measurable set. Here are examples. Okay, so, so roughly speaking, intu intuitively, everything depends on the infinite tail and not on anything finite that is done. The set of plays in which some player I plays a certain action AI infinitely often. This is tail measurable. The set of plays in which a certain action profile is played with limb subfrequency at most, whatever, any number. The set of actions in which a certain action profile is played at most finitely many times at even periods without considering, without giving any specific condition on odd periods. So these are just examples. Let me just add to that, that not all tail measurable, tail measurable sets are also Borel measurable. So there are tail measurable sets that are not Borel, just uh, to be clear. So the first result is going to be about tail measurable sets. The second and main result, actually the result is going to be about tail uh, about tail measurable pair of functions. You could you probably guess that. Now a function G is called tail measurable. If the, for every play, the set of plays where G of P is larger or equal to R is a tail set, or in other words, take a play, look at the value that the function assigns to it, change any finite number of coordinates, the function still assigns to it the same value. So changing any finite number of coordinates does not change the value that the function assigns to it. These are tail measurable functions. Examples for tail measurable functions. So suppose, and this is a frequent uh, assumption in economy, that we play an infinite play, an infinitely repeatedly play and for each period that we play there is a payoff function that is for each period there is a payoff function that is the result of the action profile chosen during that period so we play the first action we get a payoff f of the of a1 of the action profile of period one and then we play another time the second period and each one of us gets a payoff for the second period and the third period and so on so each one of us has an infinite stream of payoff, the payoff for a period one, payoff for period two, payoff for period three. And of course, in economy, they are very much worried about how to evaluate an infinite stream of payoff. One possibility to do that is to look at the limit of the, the long-term average, but then you can have limb inf, you can have limb soup, all are tail measurable. So this is the limb soup, just as an example. Of course, you can look at the limb inf of the payoffs themselves, also tail measurable. And here is a very common way to evaluate infinite stream of payoffs that unfortunately is not tail, which is the discounted sum that is often used in economy. This is not tail. So lots of interesting functions are tail measurable, but not all functions in the world are tail measurable. Here is our theorem. Any Blackwell game with a finite number of players, finite action set, and bounded, okay, that's for your question, tail measurable pair functions, admits an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon larger than zero. 
So this is, this is our theorem. And now I'm gonna walk you through the three main steps of the proof. And please, if you have questions, just stop me and ask. Outline of the proof. In step one, we're gonna talk about regularity of the mean max, regularity that is similar to the one that we have for probability measure. Step two is gonna be about tail Borel measurable winning sets. So in step two, we're gonna have a winning set for each player. And these winning sets are going to be tail Borel measurable. So that's step two. And in step three, of course, we need to go to tail Borel measurable payoff functions. We need to go from sets to functions. And each step is gonna build on the former one as often done in mathematics. Step one, regularity of the min-max. The first question is what is the min-max? The min-max of player i in non-zero sum games is simply the infimum over all the action profiles of player one's opponents, supermum over his strategies. So first question, why are we interested in the min-max and then more explanations about its nature. So this min-max is something like the answer to if all the opponents of player I decide to gang up against him and to lower his payoff as much as possible, how much can, how far they can, can they can push that, okay? How low can they push player I's payoff? S minus I here is the strategy profile of the opponents of player I. Why do we care about the opponents of player I pushing down the payoff of player I? This is not a zero sum game. Their interests are not necessarily opposing, okay? And the answer to that, and we're gonna go, gonna, I'm gonna repeat it uh, later on when we use it. We're going to use it when we construct an equilibrium. So there are several ways to construct equilibrium in a repeated game. But here is the one that we use here. It's in fact what we call the traditional way to construct an equilibrium. The players decide on a single play that they are going to play. And if they see that a player played something else than what was agreed upon, if they observe that a player deviated from this agreement, then they punish him, okay? So how much can they punish him? How low can they push his payoff? The answer to that is the min max, okay? So basically the min max of player I is about how severe can the punishment of player I be when we construct soon the equilibrium. So this is the min max. It's not a min max, it's an inf soup, but we call it min max. It's not accurate, but that's the name we use. That's the name the literature uses. We want to say something about the min max, so it's nice to know things, some properties about it. First, it's monotonic in G. Second, it has this uh, min max of A, G I plus B is A min max plus B. This is when A is larger than zero. And something that is going to be useful for us, if G is tail measurable, like we're going to have in our result, then we have the same min max in all sub games. So generally speaking, maybe after 100 periods, the opponents of player I cannot push him that much down. Maybe some of his payoff was already established. If you think about discounted sum, then this is the case. He already gained something that cannot push him that far down, okay? In case of tail measurable functions, we don't have to worry about min max that is somehow history dependent or past dependent. Whatever happened so far is just a finite number of periods. And if player i's payoff function is tail measurable, then this finite number of periods, it doesn't matter. We can always push him down to the same level as if we started from period one. So we don't need to worry about the min max changing as the game unfolds. The min max is constant along the play. This is going to be important for us. And what I'm going to show you now, or at least to describe to you that it's correct, the min max is regular. So what do I mean when I say when the min max is regular? In a minute, in the next slide, it's also not continuous 
uh, in the plays, which makes it a little bit hard sometimes. And if I, if I will have some time and you will want to see, I have an example of why it's not regular at the end of the slide after it's finished. <laughs> so what is the regularity of the min max? So it's very similar to regularity of probability measure. We claim that the min max of player I when his winning set is W, by the way, any W, not just A, is also equal to the super move of his min max when we replace his winning set by closed subsets of W. It's also equal to the infimum of his min max when we replace W with open supersets of W. So this is the first step of the proof. In fact, it's not a very surprising result because from 98 Martin and from 92 Mitra, Sadrath and Perves proved this regularity of the min max in case of two pairs. So all we had to do is generalize it to the case of the second player being all the opponents of player I ganging up together against him. So this is the regularity of the min-max. And in fact, uh, during the proof, uh, we use some kind of a variation on the proof of Martin from 98, some uh, adjustments that were needed there. But it's not a surprising result. Nice, but not surprising. Okay, so we have established, and hopefully you believe me, <laughs> that the min-max is regular. Now let's take a look at games with tail winning sets. So each player has his own winning set and each winning set is tail measurable. We can think of it like that. Each player gets one if the infinite play is in his winning set and he gets zero if the infinite play is outside his winning set and it doesn't need to be zero sum so we can have any subset of the players winning if we want. When the winning set, winning set is tail, then as we said, the min max remains constant as the game unfolds. So again, this is something not to worry about. And in fact, when we think about future research and we think about not tail measurable sets, then this is uh, one of our main concerns. How do we keep track on the min max as the game unfolds? So the min max remains constant as the game unfolds. Also, when the winning set is tail, then the min max is either zero or one. Now that's a good place to stop and give you some intuition as to why it is zero or one. So the min max here refers to the probability of player i to get into his winning set when all his opponents are ganged up against him. So suppose for a minute that the min max is half. Okay, it's not zero or one, suppose that it is half. The game unfolds, the game goes on and on and on. From Levy zero one law, or for Martin again convergence if you wish, there is going to be some period in the future far enough where the player knows that almost for certain he's inside his winning set or almost for certain he's outside his winning set. Remember that we assume just for a minute that his min max is half, okay? So consider the following strategy for player I. I wait and I have a probability half of winning. If I realize after very many periods that the probability of entering the winning set has gone close to zero, low enough, I restart my strategy. Because these are tail sets, when I restart my strategy, I have the same probability of winning as in the beginning of the game. So I had one half to begin with. When I realize that it's going low enough, I'm making hands gesture, I don't know if you can even see that. <laughs> if I, when I realize it's going low enough, I restart, I get another one half. Goes low enough again, I get another one half and another one half and this goes on forever. So you probably realize that if you have one half, really you have one. 
because you can repeat these attempts to get into the winning set as many times as you wish with one half probability as each, at, each, at each time you try. And so if you have any positive probability to get into the winning set, then you have probability one to get into the winning set. So either you have no chance of being there at all, or you can guarantee to be inside. The min max is either zero or one for tail winning sets, for tail winning sets. So this is another advantage, another property that we can use for tail winning sets. Here is an assertion that I should tell you why it's true. Uh, if there exists some play, some infinite sequence of actions that gives each player his min max, then an epsilon equilibrium exists. Why is that? So take a look at this play. Suppose that there exists such a play that gives each one his min max payoff, then the players can decide that's the play we're going to play in equilibrium. And if somebody deviates, if one of the players decides to do something else and we observe a different play, then we take the player who deviated and we punish him down to his min max level. So if there is such a play, then we can have an epsilon equilibrium. Conclusion from now, if the intersection of the set of plays that are winning for player I for all the eyes that have a min max of one is not empty, then an epsilon equilibrium exists. So again, the min max is either zero or one. If your min max is zero, it means you have zero probability of getting into your winning set. Any play guarantees you at least zero probability of being in your winning set. So any play for these players that have min max value of zero, any play is above their min max level. We don't care about them. In fact, we can almost ignore them, okay? And whatever we, we tell them to play, it's gonna be more than their min max, um, min max value. The important players are the players who can guarantee to be inside their winning set. For them, we need to verify that the play that we choose to play in equilibrium, it's carefully chosen so that it is inside each and every one of their winning sets. So what we really need to prove is that this intersection is not empty. Okay. So first, let us assume just for a minute that all winning sets are closed and the min max of all players is one simply because we ignore for now the players that have a min max value of zero. So we disregard them and we want to find something that is in the intersection of all the winning sets of players that have a min max value of one. So suppose for a minute that all winning sets are closed. Consider games with n periods. Okay, so suppose that we truncate the play after n periods and we give these players that can guarantee winning the following mission, you win in the finite play if you manage to stay inside the winning set. What does it mean to stay inside the winning set? If the play that was played, the subplay or the finite play that was played during the end periods is such that there exists some continuation that is still inside your winning set. So either the finite play is already outside your winning set and then you know you're lost. Or there is some continuation where you still have hope, okay? There is some continuation where you are still in your winning set. So the new auxiliary game is a finite game where the goal of each player from the players that can guarantee a win is just to stay with some hope to win the game. So I hope you can see that the in some sense, the winning set here in the finite game is in some sense, lar some sense larger than in the infinitely repeated game. You just have to have some continuation that enables you to win. So this is a finite game. We use it uh, to, to approximate. So in this finite game, an equilibrium exists. Why? Because if they can guarantee a win in the infinite game, they can guarantee that they stay 
in an even smaller set than in the finite game. So in the finite game, each one of these players can guarantee to win. So in the finite game, we can find an equilibrium. Now make this finite game larger, longer and longer, take increasing ends. So now you have a sequence of plays, one with n and then one for n plus one and then one for n plus two, okay? Because the min max of, player, of all players is one, there is a history in the finite game world, we already said. So we have an infinite sequence of growing plays, growing up to infinity. There is a limit to this sequence because we assumed for now that the winning sets are all closed, then this limit is inside each and every one of the winning sets of the players. So again, we used the fact that the sets are closed to say that the sequence of finite equilibria plays, a play for n, a play for n plus one, a play where the goal of the players is to not lose hope, to remain inside the winning set. This sequence has a limit because they are closed, the limit is inside their winning sets. So if the tail sets happen to be closed, we have an equilibrium. Now, we don't assume it's closed. We assume that it's Borel and tail measurable. We don't assume that it's closed. There's an L missing. Now we use regularity. We approximate the winning set from within with closed sets. That's the regularity. And now for every epsilon small enough, we can have the min max of player i when the winning set is the closed set as at least one minus epsilon. A very simple introduction to probability exercise tells us that for epsilon small enough, the probability of the intersection of all these finite set winning sets is larger, strictly larger than zero. If the probability is strictly larger than zero, then there has to be something in this intersection. There has to be some play in this intersection. This play is in is in the intersection of all disclosed subsets. So it has to be also in the intersection of all the, of all the winning sets. Okay, these are subsets of the winning set. If there exists a play in the intersection of the subsets, then it's also in the intersection of the winning sets. So we conclude that the Blackwell game with a finite set of players and finite set of actions with Borel tail measurable winning set has an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon larger than zero. This concludes the second step. Blackwell repeated games with tail measurable winning sets. Now we use it for tail measurable pair of functions, actually Borel tail measurable pair of functions. How do we do that? We define an auxiliary game where the winning set of player i are all the plays that give him at least his min max value minus epsilon, okay? Again, the winning set of player i are all the plays where he gets at least his min max minus epsilon. The min max of each player in the auxiliary game is one. Why is that? Because by the definition of min max, that's the payoff a player can guarantee. So min max minus epsilon, of course, he can guarantee that. All the players can, each player can guarantee to be inside wi when this is the way that wi is defined. So all players have a min max of one in this auxiliary game that has Winning sets that are Borel and tail measurable. If G is Borel and tail measurable, then so is Wi. Now we use the second step of the proof. Now we have winning sets that are Borel and tail measurable. And from the second step, we learned that Borel and tail measurable have a non-empty intersection. So, the play in this intersection gives each player at least his min max minus epsilon. 
So now we have an equilibrium. We have an epsilon equilibrium. The players play, actually it's two epsilon equilibrium, but we won't get into that. Uh, the players play display that is in the intersection. And if somebody deviates, they punish him to his min max level. So I said two epsilon because the min max is minus epsilon and sometimes they can only force him to min max plus epsilon, but you get the idea. And this is the final conclusion. A Blackwell game with a finite set of players, a finite set of actions, and Borel tail measurable pair functions has an epsilon equilibrium for every epsilon larger than zero. If there are questions about the proof, now is a good time because I want to move to trying to play with the proof a little bit. Actually, I have a question about the step two. Yeah. The, looking at the finite uh, prefixes, but these these are tail events you said. Yeah. So so how come they are? Maybe I'm, I'm I'm missing something. But so if there are tail events that they are not dependent on the prefix on the first few moves. Which means that if you have a value of one, yeah. Which means that if you have a value of one, then you can you can guarantee that you win regardless. Yes. Okay, so it's not only that you have a continuation, everything has a continuation in this case. In case you can win, yes. Yeah, so if yeah. you can win, then it's either empty or, or everything. Yes, it's yes. Not that, that yeah. There is some way to go. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes, really, yes. Okay. So of course, uh, once you have a result, you immediately ask yourself, how can I make it uh, more general? So the first question that we ask ourselves, can we do countably many actions? Can we do countably many players? Can we do countably many actions? No, here is why. So consider even a one-shot game, or again, you can imagine an infinitely repeated game when everything depends only on the first period. We have two players and it's a zero-sum game, and we have the winner to be the player who chooses the highest natural number. So the set of actions is all the natural numbers for each player. Of course, this game does not have a value. If you tell me the natural number you're choosing, or if you tell me your strategy, I can guarantee that I win with whatever high probability that I want to, and it's impossible for both of us to win. This is a famous game, famous in that it has no value, okay? So we have no hope in generalizing it to countably many actions, uh, unless we don't use a regular probability, but finitely additive probabilities, but, but this is not our domain. So in the repeated game, if you wanna take it into the repeated game framework, you can do the winning set of each player, the set of plays where he wins at least three quarters of the times, so okay? If you don't want everything to rely on the first period, and again, if you tell me the strategy, your strategy, I can guarantee that I win in each and every period with probability as high as I want to. And it's impossible for both of us to win with probability more than one half. So of course this game has no value either. So no hope in generalizing the results to countably many actions. How about countably many players? Uh, that's what we're working on now. We have some hope. We have uh, a proof every other day, it's a correct proof and every other day <laughs> it's a wrong proof. So we're, we're hopeful, we're working on it. Hopefully we'll have, uh, we, we will be able to say that the same thing holds for countably many players. The challenge is to get the strategies um, measurable in the sense that only finitely many players are randomizing at each period because this will enable us to use the Martin proof in similar way that we did in the paper so far. So this is one generalization that we hope to have. Of course, the other open question is when you wanna move beyond tail sets and tail measurable functions, then you cannot use all the nice features of it's either zero or one and any finite history doesn't matter, and the min max is kind of a uh, constant and uh, well behaved. So this is quite a challenge. And one more thing that we're considering of strengthening, with the winning set, I said that we have an epsilon equilibrium, 
if you look at the proof carefully, it's not clear that we need the epsilon there. And we're working on seeing whether we can drop the epsilon and get an exact equilibrium with winning sets. With G as the pair function, and general pair function, no, we used an epsilon, the epsilons all over the place, no, no hope of getting rid of them. And you already saw that sometimes you just have to have an epsilon. So these are the open questions, countably many players, and it's not written here, but beyond, yeah, beyond tail measurable payoffs. Um, not an easy challenge beyond tail measurable payoffs. And I think that, that's about it. That's the result. Um, so. Okay, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Um, okay, oh, maybe the chat. There a, ah, there oh, a... yeah, it's a link to the research paper. It's still a draft. <laughs> it's still a draft, but I can send a draftish version. Um, it may be, maybe best to wait one week until the draftish version is more clear, <laughs> clearly written, because we're still working on the countably many players. We are, have high hopes there, <laughs> but it will be soon. Other questions? Um, okay, maybe for somebody who is not in this field, just a few words about applications or, you know, why is it important to have measurable uh, versus Borel, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah, so so here uh, we, we see that if the winning sets are not Borel measurable, then maybe there is no equilibrium, no determinacy, everything. We, we cannot measure the probabilities, so we cannot compute expectations properly, and then everything is a little bit in the fog. Um, applications, that's a good question. Um, no, not so sure about uh, applications. I mean, yeah. not, not exactly from your particular paper, you know, just something a little bit broader to maybe to economics or something like that. Uh, of course, not from the yes. game theory, but a little yeah. bit. Yeah, um, so economic, if, okay, in economy, there, there are the people who look at the uh, discounted sum, and for them, it's less interesting because the discounted sum is not tail measurable. But there is also the people who look at the limb soup and limb inf of the average of the payoff. For them, this can be very interesting because uh, for them, it means that if it is tail measurable, yes, uh, if you look at the limb in for the limb soup of the long-term averages, which are usually useful when the game is played very frequently, so the discount is close to one, then it can be interesting in economics.